On today's first race of the Formula 1600 SO Protec BF Goodrich Series, we'll look back on the colorful history of Mosport Park and on the Protec profile. We'll meet the rising star, Paolo Dalcin. From Mosport Park in Ontario, TSN proudly presents round one of the 1994 ESO Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 series. And yes, the legendary of all raced here. This is Mosport, and I'm Bruce McLaren. And I'm Vic Router along with John Powell. Vic, race drivers have always needed to explain Mosport. One tough racetrack. Thousands of spectators have watched every type of world-class racing. Can-Am to Formula One. This is the birthplace of Canadian racing. Unlimited horsepower, wild technology, racing at its best. And the famous have been here. Names such as Paul Newman, Theo Fabi, Carl Haas, and the driver's Vic. We recognize Scott Goodyear. And who else? Paul Tracy. Since 1961, Mosport has created the infrastructure, the ability to train marshals, train officials, and develop young drivers in every type of race series. From Porsche and Camaro, Formula 1600 and 2000, these are the cars that have given drivers the high-speed weapons they need. Developing their skills, racing everything from the best Grand Prix machines to the obscure, even monster trucks. Want to make a fast kid faster? Go to Mosport, graduate school for the brave. The challenge is the track, and one of the toughest parts of their schooling, Vic? Without a doubt, maybe the toughest turn in the world, and that is turn two at Mosport. The legendary Sterling Moss talks to us about the famous turn two. See the blind brown. Now, at the moment, you can see it fairly easily because you've got the banks. But when you're coming this direction, there's nothing. You're, you're setting up into a skyline with no feature at all. That's difficult. You have to decide where you want your apex to be, and whichever place it is, it's likely to be wrong. If it's wrong, you're in trouble. But the important thing here is to try to get the car in the right place, and when you land, don't sort of turn, because if you do, the, it's light, and you've got to get the back end, and you're going to spin down here. So this is the type of corner that takes enough nerve that separates a champion from just a guy in the back of the field? Well, I like to think it's not nerve. I like to think it's your experience that helps you, because <laughs> nerve, you don't want too much nerve. But equally, this, this is the probably the most difficult uh, corner in North America, actually. And John Powell, you have to wonder what turn two has in store for today's racers. The cars and drivers are lined up on the starting grid, 15 laps around this 3.95 kilometer circuit. And we have a huge field, 36 cars, as we take a look at the starting grid. On pole, Martin Guimont, a racing instructor. This man is fast, sponsored by the kingmaker, Victor Sifton. Sharing the front row, 23-year-old Christian Vertiber, the student sponsored by Il Perot Toyota. Uh, passing here is pretty important, and the setup is uh, you got to plan it pretty much in advance because of the fast corners. And especially with the fast corners, you want to try to get a good drive out of them and really set up the pass under braking for the next corner, which can uh, be pretty uh, advantageous. Inside second row number 60, Marc Momini, a 42-year-old engineer from Granby, Quebec, sponsored by Les Entreprises Jacques Cadoret. And beside Mark, a good friend of ours, a colleague, broadcasting colleague from Le Réseau des Sports in Quebec, Didier Schreinen. Yeah, last year I was, uh, it was my first taste of a Formula car. By the way, at the first race, I didn't, well, I have 15 minutes experience in a Formula car. And uh, now it's getting uh, much better. Uh, I feel more confident. I don't know what happened this winter, but uh, last year I was expecting to do podiums. Now I want to win races, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna try my best. Here is Keith Willis in a car that he built and designed himself. Starts are very tricky because of the standing starts. Um, the big important thing is to get into corner one uh, as, as far, as quick as possible and get as many guys as possible. Being that you're starting from a standing start is very difficult. So it's, uh, the big thing is to make sure that you're not going to have any contact with anybody. Paolo Dalcin will start from the third row in today's race. We'll meet him later in our Protec profile. Paolo, Rookie of the Year last season. Bruno Bianchi, you see, starting from row four, finished in third place in the overall championship as the cars are rolling. 
At last, Vic Picasso rolling. The tension builds on the grid unbearably when they're waiting to go. Once the machine moves, then they can start getting psyched up for the start, Vic. You see the retired NATO General Lou McKenzie driving number 99 in row eight. As we say, a large field of 36 cars. First race of the season, quite often, drivers try to do too much too quickly, forgetting that it is a full campaign. That's right, and the track is green, Vic. The winter is tough in Canada. There are still bumps that haven't gone away. The frost is coming out of the ground slowly. It's a big challenge for these drivers as they follow the Pontiac pace car. Look at Guimard. You know he's ready as he weaves that Reynard. In fact, we are all ready. 36 cars are ready for this opening round here at Mosport. The ESSO Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series on TSN is brought to you in part by ESSO Protec, the leader in protection engineered in Canada for superior protection. BF Goodrich Tires, because no other tires will do. And by Mini Disc from Sony, the smaller, recordable, compact disc. Welcome back to Mosport Park, this opening race of the SO ProTech BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series. Vic Router along with John Powell as the cars continue on their warm up lap as we take a look at Bruno Bianchi, who is carrying our Sony Handicam today. And we compare his driving style to that of Greg Moore in 1991. Greg, of course, has moved on to Indy Lights, recently had a test with the Penske team, Indy Cars. Notice the difference in driving style, John. You notice Bianchi's working the wheel a whole lot more than Greg Moore. So right away, my eyes say, gee, I like Moore better. But uh, it's all a question of the day. This is the opening race for Bianchi. So uh, yes, he's working the wheel, wheel a little bit more. The track is colder. And of course, Bianchi hoping to do what Moore has done. Remember, this series round the world is a stepping stone to bigger series. In Europe, usually Formula 3000. Here in Canada and North America, of course, 1600 has led to Formula Atlantic, Indy Lights, and eventually many of these drivers hope to perform in Indy cars. So we'll watch Bruno Bianchi as he carries our Sony Handicam here in 1994. The cars continue their final warm up lap as they come to the top of the Mario Andretti straight. No one knows this track better, most sport, than you. John, because you uh, teach racing here. Yes, I've been uh, teaching it for 15 years of motorsport, 25 years uh, in racing. 
And you know, I don't always agree with weaving on the pace lap. I think it unsettles the drivers. We'll have to see how Guimont takes this start, Vic. And in fact, you know, when you mention a green track, first race of the season, standing start, will there be much rubber still there on, on the grid after a winter? A delicate balance as you let the clutch out to get just enough spin to get the revs up and get the car off the line or too much and then burn out and no deal. The number 90, that yellow car of Keith Willis, that a home-built arrow as you see the cars now lining up for this standing start. One of the few series as well as Formula Atlantic that does use a standing start. 36 cars on the starting grid for this first race of the season. And watch now, Martin Guimont, who has the pole position. Would you prefer to be inside right or outside left on that front row? Always on the inside, going down into the, uh, the hill into corner one. Boy, the tension's building here as they line up, Vic. The balance between revs and clutch and the whole shot. This is a drag race. And as we say quite often now, with such nerves, such tension, first race of the season, drivers can be guilty of wanting to do too much. Watching now for the marshal at the back of the field to give the high sign. We'll watch for the starting light. Listen for the revs to come up. We've got a green. Gimon stopped. A very poor start, Vic. He's dropped way back. The pole sitter is in trouble as they flood through turn one. Three wide down corner one. We're underway and clean into corner two. Three wide, and look at this. Christian Vertiber has grabbed the lead on Guimont's mistake. And look at Didier Schraden outside to grab second spot through turn two. At the bottom of two, yes, there's a move. Schraden goes inside. Didier Schraden grabs the lead, moving inside to take it. And is, oh my goodness, it looks like Vertiber's trying the tight line. It doesn't work. Schraden takes over. Look at Guimont from the back. When Guimont has made up two, three positions already. So after the problems as they come through the hairpin 5A and 5B for the first time, Guimont has got himself back into it. Guimont squeezed out Del Chin from 5A to 5B. That move does not often work, but look at this. Guimont's going up the long straight. He's got Del Chin pushing him from behind and he's trying to close on the draft as they go up. This is everything and Bianchi right up behind Del Chin. Bianchi in the red, number four, currently running in fifth place, but it is Didier Schreinen as they come through. Vic Gima grabbed another spot underneath it at corner eight. What a great comeback by the pole sitter who had so many problems. He's woken up, Vic Gima is second as they come out of corner 10 and they head down to the stripe, it's Gima following Schrein and Vertiver, Del Chin and Bianchi. And let's remember, this track with so much history and the feeling is you either love it or you hate it, Schrein right now loves it. The more you race in Mossport, the more you like the track. At the beginning, it's frightening a little bit, but uh, it is a real race track. I mean, I don't want to say a thing against uh, um, a city circuit or things like that, but they have things to worry about. Here, it's a race track, so it's a lot of Ford gear, uh, flat out, corners that the car slides and it's it's great for a driver but it costs a lot if you're making a mistake that's that's making it uh, even greater if I can say so DDA Schrader and he has a lead but look at who is closing through two that is our pole setter Marta Guimont Guimont down out of two and into three yes he's gonna do it a wonderful pass, clear, right in, presents himself. Schreinen has no choice but to let him go. But Schreinen's back on his tail again. What a great showing by Guimont. Let's remember, off the start, he was the pole sitter, fell back to sixth, and in a lap and a half, has the lead back as they come through Moss Corner. Down the chute and through 5B, all challenging for the lead, and car number seven is uh, Mark, Mark Green, Green. from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Up the straightaway, three wide. A little early, Vic, to pull out of the draft. They're not too patient. Uh-oh. We have a spin. John Pazinski from Brampton, Ontario, in his number 77. And all he can do now is just sit and watch. The whole field streams by as we go to the head. And there it's four. Bianchi trying to draft by Del Chin. And then up by Guimau. 
Will he do it? Schreinen making a challenge. Inside, no. Great couple of battles for first and second in the battle, then between third, fourth, fifth, and sixth places here in this second lap at Mosport. Through nine and into ten and down the straightaway, Gima again from Schreinen, Dalchin, and Bianchi. Bianchi in that red number four, like so many cars, has upgraded now from an old Swift to the brand new Van Diemen. The equipment has to be new. The racing is tight as they go down corner two, following Gima. And Bianchi Vickers wild, wide in two. He'll overheat his tires. He won't be able to make that challenge he wants so desperately to make. Interesting, though, as we look back now, Guimont has put a little bit of space between himself and that second-place car of Schreinen with Del Chin and Bianchi in third and fourth, respectively. Vic Guimont has to hope that in racing each other for second place, he will be able to pull away. Schreinen, Del Chin, Bianchi through five. It's clean. Yes, now into the draft. Del Chin is closing up on Schreinen as they go up the straight. Now you can take a look. If you look at the back of Schreinen's car, there is a piece of what appears to be tape. As Del Chin has a look, Bianchi moves to the outside. You can see the tape hanging off the back as they go three wide up the Mario Andretti straight. Can Del he hold on? Del Chin inside Schreinen. Will he put it away? Vic! Inside, and he's got him inside. No! Two wide through nine into... I can't believe this. Who's coming out? Who's coming out is Paolo Del Chin in second place as he grabs it from Schreinen, followed by Bruno Bianchi. And now look at the battle these two have. Bruno Bianchi and Paolo Del Chin. Through the shoot, 5A into 5B. Bianchi closing up, working the wheel too much. Del Chin gets away from him. Watch the draft here. Vic, he's working his way up. He can almost taste it as he's going up the straight 125 miles now, closing in inexorably on Dal Chin. Will he go right? Will he go left? He goes left, and does he have him? No, he didn't, because when they came to the crest of the hill, it would be Dal Chin who would regain the lead on Bianchi. It is Paolo Dal Chin leading Schreinen and Bianchi, and up ahead of them, of course, and pulling away while they battle is Martin Guimont. Look at Bianchi trying it inside now on Schreinen. Inside of corner two does not work. As they go down the hill, it is still Dalchin, Schreinen, Bianchi, and Schreinen getting a little wild now. Bianchi closing up through corner three. And we're seeing them throw the cars around a little bit more than what we might have expected as that piece of, oh, I don't know, tape or something continues to hang off the back of DDA Schreinen's car. And again, this battle by these two, Schreinen and Bianchi, through 5A and 5B, allowing Del Chin to pull away. What a race. Bianchi could almost tow himself up the straightaway, hanging on to that tape coming out of Schreinen's car. And finally, it does blow away as we look back in the field, and at number 99B, that is Lou McKenzie, the retired Canadian Armed Forces General, racing in the B-Class, which is for cars 1984 and older. Lou McKenzie, of course, driving an 81 PRS. Having a great battle with Bruce Anderson from Woodlawn, Ontario, in an 88 Van Diemen. Lou McKenzie telling me the story. He fell in love with racing when he was stationed in Europe, and he used to go to the home of Jim Clark. Jim Clark used to race at Hockenheim. Long straightaways, lots of slipstreaming, and Anderson has gotten by McKenzie up the straightaway in the draft. Now we come back to our leaders, and you see Del Chin going by. Schreiner continues to hold on to third place, and that tape, would that tape just go away? Finally, it just hanging off the car now of Schreinen with Bianchi trying to close. They go up the straightaway. Bianchi, Schreinen, Gimo in the lead, Del Chin in second. And Bianchi makes a move, and he's picked up that tape on his rearview mirror there. Now he tries the outside, and this turns out to be, look at this, good luck tape as he's got him as they crest the hill. A bold move as Bianchi takes over from Schreinen and sets off to Del Chin. Inside the car, out of eight, through corner nine. Bianchi working his way to close up through ten. 
He's got Delchin in his sights as they come up across the stripe over the speed bumps. Bruno, Bruno pushing all the way. Bruno Bianchi now off and chasing the second place car, Paolo Delchin, and up ahead in the clean, that's your leader, Martin Guimont. Great action as they go over the crest into two. Look at Bianchi, closes right up on Delchin. Uh-oh, wide. Bring it back into the apex at the bottom of two and over to three. This is a great motor race, Vic. And we got a great idea of how two works. It just threw Bianchi's car to the right, although he wanted to go left. And Dal Chin pulls out of three and they head for corner four. He's got a little bit of a margin again. Down corner four. Here he is under the player's bridge, down under braking, closing right up under Dal Chin, up through 5A into 5B, right underneath. Look at this, Vic, into the draft. That key sponsored number four. Closing up the straight again. The rubber band is stretched, and now Bianchi's bringing it down, Vic. Will he make it? Dal Chin, this will be two cars in two laps. He tried here earlier, remember, and couldn't get Dal Chin. Will he get him this time? Yes. Yes, he's got him. The most improved driver a year ago in this series now has moved into second place. And Gima leads, but Bianchi is on his uh, tail as they come out of nine into 10. Look at Bianchi, he must feel proud. He's been able to work his way up to Gima, who has unquestionably got the edge today. What a great performance by Bruno Bianchi. He holds down second place as we take a look at the top five. The ESO Protec, BF Goodrich, Formula 1600 Series on TSN. Welcome back to Mosport Park as we watch the battle for second between Bruno Bianchi in that red number four and Paolo Dal Chin in his blue 27. Bianchi still wild in two. The 1988 go-kart champion. Bianchi has car control. Dal Chin, a young engineer, seems to have a lot of patience. And the question is, while Guimar runs away, can Dal Chin get Bianchi? The only way that Dal Chin is going to be able to make this Vic is up the straightaway and in the drag. And this brings up that age old question. As somebody like Dal Chin trying to hold on, do you look in your mirrors as a racer? The mirrors don't exist, but what they have to do is work together. If they work together, if Dal Chin takes Bianchi and then gets a draft back, they can catch up to Gibon. But Bianchi's a car racer. He's giving nothing to Dal Chin. And you're right, it's something we forget. It can work equally for both cars in hoping to catch the leader.
Today on the Esso ProTech Profile, our subject is Paolo Del Chin. And Paolo is equally at home whether he's revving up a Formula 1600 engine or a Pratt & Whitney jet. The 26-year-old engineer pursuing careers in both fields, and to him there is a natural connection. Well, I think as an engineering student uh, coming out of U of T, my interest in high-tech uh, items, especially uh, aircraft engines and, and car engines and car racing, all blended in well. And when I saw the opportunity to come and work here at Pratt Whitney, I applied through our career center at school. And they gave me an interview and then a job. This company is, is at the forefront in uh, air, air, aircraft engine design and testing. And that's the area in which I work in here. And both here and, and in motor racing, you're always searching for the absolute performance from the product be it a race car, be it a plane engine. But do racing drivers make good engineers? His boss thinks so. Well, certainly when we're out looking for new graduates to bring into the company, because this is a, a high technology, fairly fast paced company, we're looking for graduates who have done more than simply go through college and pass exams. We're looking for people with initiative that can handle pressure. And certainly when we interviewed Paolo, he showed those um, immediately and his involvement certainly with racing is evidence that he uh, can handle pressure and shows initiative. And Paolo's career choice, certainly no surprise to his family. For toys, there was car or airplane. There was only those two types of toys. And uh, he started like it very much. He was playing with God all the time. It's been uh, a long road for me to get this far. And that road started with my mom taking me to the go-kart tracks. And she used to take me every morning before work uh, all the way out to Family Cartways in Whitby and then drive all the way back to Toronto before work started. And she used to start at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I, I, when I was going there, I was the only woman and there was all men, the father with the boys. And so I said, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Other people recognized uh, her efforts and, and my efforts to, to be fast and started helping out by giving us carts to run and engines to use and tires to use. And that made it financially viable for me to continue. I, I like frustrated oil racing, you know, I like uh, all types of car racing. And I go because if I stay home, I all the time worry, I cannot concentrate. It. Instead, I go in there, I'm, I'm peaceful, I like it. I go and I watch every race, I go when he's uh, go out for practicing, I go in every corner and I go and see how he's doing. And I, I really enjoy that. Especially in the last year or so, uh, my sister's been able to, to give me a hand with the racing. Uh, the bills get quite high and uh, what sponsorship doesn't make up for and, and what I can't make up for, uh, she, she pitches in and helps to make sure I get to the next race. So it's, it's a really a group effort to go racing like it is for anyone else. You, know, you just can't go anywhere in the sport without your family. Well, I think um, that what I would like to do for him, and I'm trying to do for him, is just to hold the door open for him. That's how I see it, um, be it through financial help or moral support or even some varied suggestions. Sometimes being a little bit more removed, you can see things that being involved you cannot. Um, so I think that that uh, is what I feel my role is, and I will continue to do so for as long as I can help. My long-range goal would be to be in Indy cars as quickly as possible. Uh, but really what dictates, there's two things that dictate that. One is my personal development as a driver, and the other is the business plan that I can put together for myself and my sponsors to get us there. You know, what series you run is also important to your sponsor because you have to address the market that they're interested in. So Canadian companies are interested, interested in general in Atlantic cars unless they're interested in expanding into the U.S., in which case they're interested in Indy Lights. Uh, so I'd like to see myself go Atlantic Car or Indy Lights in the very near future, if not next year, definitely the year after, and then into Indy Cars in whatever time I can after that. Paolo Dalci in the 25-year-old, remarkable how far he's come so quickly, only began racing in 1990, and he continues the chase here as he goes after Bruno Bianchi. Co-cop backgrounds in both these people, Nick, and the patience displayed by Del Chin has to be tempered with the fact 
that Bianchi is in a hurry and he's not giving up anything to Dal Chin. Once again up the Mario Andretti straight away. The draft is important. What should be happening here, Vic, is that Bianchi should move over, let Dal Chin by, pick up the draft, and accelerate the mass in pursuit of Gima. They're not doing that. John, we've got a crash coming out of turn two, notorious turn two. One, two, three cars have been collected. The drivers are moving around there all right. Let's look at the replay. Bowman gets it all wrong at the bottom apex of two. Kirby clips him. Wow, the machines are badly bent here. Klubine is all right. I think he spun just to avoid the uh, collision between Bowman and Kirby. And we had two cars. How fortunate they were to get through. Robert Peters following in behind. And then Hadjakovic also getting through in his car number 42B. But certainly Bowman, he got it as you suggest, all wrong. And that is a bad corner. We talked about it earlier. Both out of the car, both all right. But two cars decidedly second hand as we watch second place. Bianchi and Dal Chin down over the top of two. Yankee pulling out just a margin on Del Chin as they go down into three. But of course, it's a yellow flag and they can wait for it. They've got a green as they come out of corner three and the action is on again. That's right. It's interesting. The race not stopped at that point. You could see them as they sort of funnel between the two cars on other, either side of the track. The Yankee into five. A through 5B, Del Chin picks up ever so slightly. Here's the draft again. Del Chin just doesn't seem to have enough, Vic, to get by the Yankee. In pit lane, he started on the second row. Mark Momani from Grand Beat, Quebec. All kinds of trouble when they pull off the engine cover. It's all over. He cannot get back into the hunt. The best he can hope is scrape out a finish for points. The former ice racer, the 42-year-old, Mark Momani, as we go back to the front of it. There you is your leader, Martin Guimont, who is comfortably in front now. What a wonderful job he did to get up. Oh, my goodness, did you see Bianchi over the speed curve? Bianchi still wild, still up on the speed bumps, and that's the story. Bianchi a wild that he can't get enough margin on Guimont, and Del Chin not enough horsepower as they head for corner two. Oh! A smoking car, number eight. That is Graham Pepler from Gloucester, Ontario, has burned it up and will head to pit lane. Gimo picks his way through the accident in corner two. Bianchi and Del Chin put the heat back on. And you're right, John, it is over for the 26-year-old Graham Pepler, who we saw go into pit lane with that smoking engine. They push his car now back to the garage area. Vic, Another former Carter, as well as raced in New Zealand. Vic, very disappointed, this young man. The day is over. Opening race of this SO Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 series for Graham Pepler. And you can see now the field has come up to some back markers, and so it'll be interesting to see what kind of effect they have on these, the leaders, as we see. Oh, again, starts to slide it through. Bianchi, and you've got to think that he's feeling the pressure of Del Chin. Del Chin much cleaner through 5B. Now he's got the momentum going up the straightaway, closing up on Bianchi. Now the question is, does he have the horsepower? Oh! Look at that. Some of the cowling work, the engine cover of Mark Momani has come flying off. Remember that Momani was in pit lane earlier. Maybe some sloppy work by some of his pit crew to put it back on. That's right, Vic, and a dangerous situation here with debris on the track. Momani will get black flag for sure for this as Gima, Bianchi, and Del Chin continue their battle. And you can see the drivers with their hands up as we have another spin at Moss Corner coming out of 5B. That is Glenn Hoare in the number 75. And also involved the number two of Martin Walter. And Martin Walter and his car are the subject of this week's BF Goodrich Track Fact. There is a special award given each year to the best looking car. Martin Walter has won the design prize two years in a row. And here at Mostport, he unveiled his new Marilyn Monroe motif. Yeah, this is done by a friend of mine called Stickman. Um, essentially, we have a, a 
a prize at the end of the year for the best looking car. And uh, he did 1600 two years in a row, won it two years in a row. He did my car last year and we won it last year. So he's going for a perfect record. And uh, Marilyn Monroe was just uh, an idol of ours. So we put her on the car this year. She doesn't pay real well though, unfortunately. No, Martin, but she looks absolutely great. Great looking car, Martin Walter, as the large field continues to make its way up. And you see back there, the track, the marshal finally picking up some of the cowling as Mark Momoni forced in with the black flag. That's right, and that's the right decision. It's sad for Momoni to come in the pits, but that's the way it must be. And talking of the way it must be, back to the action. The depth of field here is very, very good. The spear carry is really putting on some great racing and behave pretty well. Interesting, the hand signals going on there, the back markers, obviously, they're looking in their mirrors. You know, they want to make sure they see the leaders coming. And the leaders are Gima, Bianchi, and closing up, Dal Chin. And here's a chance. Now here, Bianchi can get the advantage, take the draft off that slow car. So he's up, gets a draft, pulls out. Dal Chin does the same thing, but Dal Chin's not getting as much. Now Bianchi's got a chance to put a little bit of air and get after uh, Gima. Will he do it? Well, so far he hasn't been able to, and you wonder if he can. It doesn't seem that Bianchi has enough horsepower to make the difference. Earlier we saw that Graham Pepler blew the engine. He's out of the race, but standing by with our Michelle Craig. Graham Pepler, what was the problem? Uh, I'm not really sure. Just on the last lap, uh, I suddenly lost uh, lost power. Uh, just progressively lost, started losing power. and. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a throttle problem, it's obviously an engine problem because about halfway through the lap or three quarters of the way through the lap, I looked at my mirrors and I saw a lot of blue smoke coming out, so I guess it's oil. Uh, disappointing, obviously. It wasn't going very well from the start. It started tightening up actually a few laps into the race and uh, started hearing a bit of a, a tinging and uh, that was it. It was gone. We're late in this opening round of the ESO Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series. Martin Guimau continues to lead. Welcome back to Mosport Race 1 of this SO Protect BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series. And yes, time is running out for Bruno Bianchi as Bianchi in his red number four looking to get by Martin Gimel and how it has closed up now, John. Bianchi's done a great job of catching up. And if you look at it, Gimel's getting a little bit wide with that Reynard. It's burning up the tires a little bit. Bianchi is set, but he's going to have to make a move soon. 
As we look back in the field and check out the white car, the 99B, that's the retired General Lou McKenzie in a great duel with a back marker. That's David Klubine, but look at McKenzie in the number six, the silver car of Mario Blanchett of Collingwood, Ontario. Blanchett's in an A car, but McKenzie's having a great dice, Vic. Yeah, let's remind everyone again, because this is a series of A and B cars, and McKenzie in a B car, one that is older than 1984, currently running in 12th position and actually passing an A car. An A car, a Euro Swift, that's 10 years younger. Probably 10 years younger than Lou. He won't like to say him that. There they go up the straightaway, and Blanchard gets the uh, margin on Lou, and Lou tucks him behind as they continue their dice. Now, is it just a case of horsepower up the straight? Is that where he has the advantage, Blanchard? I'm not sure if uh, it's just not a question of the draft and dicing and trading positions. Lou's doing a heck of a job here. Closing up out of 10, down into corner one. As we go back now to the leader, Guimont continuing to hold on ahead of Bianchi. Bianchi tucked right in through nine. Underneath, going into 10, will he be able to make a move? This is going to be a long run as they come out clean. Yes, clean down into corner one. Bianchi tucked up right behind Gimo. This has got to be his chance. But look at the margin, Vic. Gimo stretches it out through corner one, and Bianchi loses. But interestingly, you notice Gimo touched the speed curbing where Bianchi didn't. Both wild, though, and they're not making any difference. John, a couple of interesting stories as we look back at some of the back markers here. Great racing going on. The number 10, the blue car, that is Sylvain Pirini. Hasn't been in a car since 1985. Used to race Formula Atlantic. And then a little farther up the field in the number 35, a native. He was born in Wiesbaden, Germany. Makes his home in Arlington, Texas. The number 35 of Mike Sauce. Usually yeah. drives SCCA club racing now has come up here again looking to further his career and this is not a small man Mike sauce it's a tough fit in that little uh, Euro Swift and good racing as they come up the straightaway Bianchi making a move trying to get enough draft by Guimont didn't make it see if he can do it again yes around the outside on the left Guimont takes the inside looks across moves back over Bianchi doesn't make it you can hear the squealing of the tires. Now we're getting late, remember. When can Bianchi make the move? And is Paolo Chow Chin just waiting for one of these drivers to make a mistake? Gima and Bianchi are not likely to make that mistake. Trying to get by, Bianchi's trying awful hard. Yeah, and you wonder about the tires as we run down the entire field for you in this opening race of the SO Protect PF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series. You talk about tires. How much can they really stand? Who has, do you think, the advantage when it comes to the tires? The tires have to be driven at a certain edge of consistency, and I think Gimo's probably done the best job, and Bianchi's used up most of his earlier. And that's the difference between winning and losing. As we watch, the tail end is through corner four. Maybe, Vic, this is going to be Bianchi's chance. Well, exactly. You would think that Bianchi needs something to hold up Guimont. Maybe those back markers will do. My goodness, is he ever sawing on the wheel? Working away. I think the tires are out. Dal Chin, in fact, is coming back. Guimont stretching out, and they will run into the back markers as they come through corner eight. This should lead to a very interesting finish. And we have a car off. Number 90, Keith Willis from Milton, Ontario, in his home-built 1990 Aero is off course. Keith Willis. He didn't hit the barriers. He's all right in the car as we go back to the leaders and Gimo, Bianchi, and Del Chin. Now look at the three cars, the back markers. Inside goes Gimo. Here comes Bianchi right away. Bianchi could not afford to wait. He had to go with him. You're right, Vic. And he went with him, and now they're closing on 24. Peters, and he may well play the, the position piece here as they head down into corner one. Bianchi tucked in behind Gima. Del Chin follows. Does he get through? Del Chin goes underneath Peters. And Peters is wide! 
Vic, he brings it back, thank goodness. Well, you know, you got to give Peter some credit. He let him go through, endangering himself, really, by going that wide. And Bianchi goes outside. Uh, there's a car there. He can't pass there. There's a yellow. And then he goes wide into three. That was a move. It was too soon. Bianchi's not patient. Del Chin has closed up on Bianchi. And Gima, as they head down corner four, it's closing up on more bank markers. And we have a spin. Another spin, again, at 5B. And that is Michel Provo, who goes spinning off the course at the hairpin. Bianchi through the dust as we wait. Another car is off. That is David Klubine off at turn nine. And so late in the race, everybody giving it that little bit extra late. And we're having some kind of problems. David Klubine from Brantford, Ontario. The battle continues, though. And look at Paolo Dalcin sticking his nose right up the exhaust of Bruno Bianchi. Will he take him? He's, uh, Bianchi moves to the inside, blocks the position as they go through. They're coming onto the penultimate lap here. And it's Gima, Bianchi, Dal Chin pushing ever so hard to get by. Oh, and look at the fishtailing that our leader, Gima, does. And it may be that his tires are also wearing a little thin. Gima giving it everything he's got. Bianchi losing a bit. Dal Chin pressing ever so hard. This race, the top three, anybody can win this race. And you're right, Vic, Gima is getting wilder and wilder. And the interesting thing, it doesn't take much. It's only hundredths of a second, thousandths of a second. A little mistake could cost you the race. Gima, two wheels off at the bottom of two. Bianchi closing, but going wide as they come out of corner three. Dal Chin seems to be making the least number of mistakes, but he has to get by two people to win this one. Down through four, into five. Bianchi from Gima. Dal Chin closing up. Wide and Here Dal comes Chin Dal inside. Chin. It's a drag race through 5C. Neck and neck, side by side. Bianchi has a little bit of horsepower. Boy, you know what? You could see him go wide. The tires giving on him, and Dal Chin thought he'd take advantage. Maybe he'll take the advantage of the draft right here. They're poised to make it. Dal Chin right up. Uh, Bianchi to the left, to the right. No, Bianchi is driving very well defensively, holding off the spirited charge from Del Chin. Gima profits. Whoa, wide Look, through nine. Gima looking like an ice racer as he slides it through nine, up on the curbing as we get ready now for our final lap. It's a shame, Bianchi had it all. He was so close, and those miscues cost him dearly. Del Chin closing up, and into the pits. This is Christian Vertiver, and John, we're told that this is for a black flag as the marshal goes over. Now, it, it under, it, you can't move over on people, is what he's saying. I guess when the competition is so intense, you don't give any margin, and uh, obviously he stepped over. So Christian Vertiber, as we look at Paolo Dal Chin, heads back out after the stop and go, the warning from the marshal. What a great battle, though, as we go back to our leaders, Guimont, Bianchi, and Paolo Dal Chin. And as we go up the straightaway, we'll see them out of three, down four. It's up the straightaway that the difference is going to be made. Let's find out what happened. Cliff Dawson is the marshal with Christian Vertiber. Yeah, so we had uh, several reports on the track from the corner workers that he'd be moving over on the other cars. And, of course, that's not permitted in our racing. Everybody's entitled to room on the track. He had a stop and go. He's back in the race. And the action continues. Gima, Bianchi, locks up going down into five. Bianchi's giving it everything he's got, Vic, as they come out of 5B up the straightaway. He has to make a move. So he's got Dalchin up behind him. He's closing in the draft. There's not too many cars in front of them. This is the time for a move. Watch Bianchi. As close as he maybe has been the entire race, he goes left. He goes left. Talk about giving room. Four wheels off. Gimo squeezes him. Bianchi hangs on as they come through nine. In, 
and Zhu Ten, what a brave move. Mario Kimon, one more turn and then he'll see the checkered flag. One last chance possibly for Bruno Bianchi. He won't get there in time as Martin Guimont will win the opening race here at Most Point. What an outstanding finish for Guimont and Bruno Bianchi. Just a revelation, don't you think, Vic? Absolutely. What a great race to finish second. And then Paolo Del Chin, all three cars, really off to what you would say disappointing starts, able to work their way back up and then contend for the lead. And there is DDA Schrainen, and he has to be disappointed because he grabbed the early lead only to give it back. DDA Schrainen finishing fourth. Bruno Bianchi acknowledging the crowd as he makes his way. And we have a spin, number 47, Daniel Samari spins in turns eight and nine. Gets on, back on the track and he'll finish 11th. But that's on the cool off lap he spins. Unbelievable. You saw John Pazinski happy to finish 17th, one lap down. Well, this has got to be a great beginning for a super season. Martin Gimal leading his second and third place finishers, Bruno Bianchi and Paolo Jalchin. And it was that last move that just failed for Bruno Bianchi. He tried to go left. Now, in fact, did he try to block him a little bit? Did Gimo close the door on him? I think Gimo squeezed him off, and that's all, all she wrote. But, you know, these last lap moves, nobody gets hurt. Nobody is uh, put right off, and Gimo has the win. He can't take it away. There is your winner, Marta Gimo into pit lane to accept congratulations from his crew after that disappointing start. He started on the pole, seemed to get lost, seemed to miss the green light, and then finally, after falling to sixth, come back within a lap and a half to grab the lead. An outstanding drive. The top three finishers, Gima, Bianchi, and Paolo Dalcin. Your top five in this opening round here at Most Port. So here are the final results of this very exciting opening round of the 
Esso Protec BF Goodrich Formula 1600 Series for 1994. Christian Vertiber, who had that stop and go for what well, they consider maybe rough driving, finishes sixth. But congratulations to Martin Guimont, who wins this opening round, and that's despite getting off to a very poor start at the green light. Well, it's, it didn't start too good. I couldn't, the way I was sitting close to the light with the sun, I couldn't see the light at all. And uh, I just started a bit late, but I catch up and uh, it was a good race, it was fun. Well, after uh, missing the start like that, I was a bit upset and I just went for it for a couple of laps. And that's good, that's what we're here for, have fun and it's good. It's the first champagne shower of a new season. Bruno Bianchi holding off Paolo Dalcin for second. Uh, I had a good start. Uh, the, some guy in front of me maybe missed their start. I was at corner one, I was fifth, I think, after the start. Then I keep following Paolo, and he was fighting with DJ Scranton, so I, I, I was able to pass them uh, after three or four laps. Then I began to try to catch Martin Guimont, who was first. I catch him uh, two laps before the end. At the last lap, I tried to pass him in the back stretch, but he kind of uh, take his line and shut the door. I had to put two wheels on the grass. But then I say, okay, let's go for second place. <laughs> it was a two corner left, so I'm saying, okay. Congratulations again. Paolo, that was a great race. Could you give me uh, your description of it from start to finish? Well, I had a really good start off the start of the, at the start, and um, going down into turn two, I tried to get into second off the bat, but uh, DJ squeezed me out, so I had to settle for third. But we were missing horsepower. That was our big problem, and coming up the back straight, I'd always lose three or four car lengths. So I just tried to hang on and do the best I could. And let's remember there's a race within a race, the B-Class, Lou McKenzie, retired general, Lou McKenzie, the winner in B-Class. Now, after every race, the cars, the top cars, are inspected. And one of the reasons Esso goes racing is to continue its research and development of Esso Supreme unleaded fuel and Protec engine oil. What we're really interested in the racing environment is how the uh, racing circuit uh, degrades oil quality. And we're convinced that our conventional oils that have improved significantly in the last few years with the upgrade in, uh, in oil categories will actually survive in this environment. It's a little hard convincing the, uh, the, the car drivers and the engine builders of this. And so what we're doing now is we're taking oil samples, and we don't care what oil they're using. We'll analyze any of the oils, and we're really looking for how the oils are breaking down. Our expectation is, is that there's going to be wear debris that's coming from the engine and going into the, into the oil. And we'll be measuring the level of that debris, and we'll also be measuring the breakdown of things like viscosity that the oil uh, needs to have to give the engine proper protection. So we're going to analyze the oils, uh, compare our, the performance of our Protec oil, which actually won the B-Class today. Uh, the winning car had our Protec 20W50. And, uh, and, and try and, uh, we're convinced, but try and convince the racing community that our oils are doing as good a job as the, as the national brands. Today's race is brought to you in part by Esso Protec, the leader in protection engineered in Canada for superior protection. By BF Goodrich, because no other tires will do and by mini-disc from Sony, the smaller recordable compact disc. Now on behalf of John Powell and our entire crew, I'm Vic Rauter. Thanks for joining us. Till we talk with you again next time, goodbye from Mostport.